Hi people, Joe all here. This is a sequel episode on my reaction video on Tom Bukovac uh, homeschooling volume 14 episode. Today we're gonna see what are the idiosyncrasies of playing at uh, different volume levels. Let's briefly remember what Tom has to say about that. If a guy's playing a Gibson, you can always hear him. And when they're playing a Fender, you can never hear him. I think it has something to do with the, the mid-range content. A Fender can sort of uh, disappear because there's not a lot of mid-range in those pickups, you know what I mean? Uh, one thing I learned when I was playing with Walsh in, in arenas, man, that's a whole different set of rules there. All these aspects are very important to every guitar player on the, on the stage. Mm, they are common and I suppose that a lot of us is conscious in some way or another of what's going on. Uh, however, Tom just glances these topics and uh, without any... We can rightly assume that the, the majority of us mortals are um, will be relegated mostly to small local clubs. Anyhow, the stage sides should compel us to to find the, the, the right strategies to sound at our best. So, what's the issue with different volume levels? Uh, we experienced uh, this early in our musical life. Precisely, the first time we abandoned a room to join a band in a rehearsal venue. Two things are happening at that moment. Uh, first, the volume knob position uh, depending on the amp wattage changes from one or even below uh, to probably somewhere around five. And this change produces a completely different uh, sound image from uh, we, were, we were used to. You can experience this also while listening to music. Uh, if you turn turn the music down to barely audible and then turn it up loud, the difference should be evident. The second thing is that our sound has to fit within the band, but that's a huge segment and to include here. So let's stay focused for now on what and how different volume levels affect the guitar sound. In our room, or at low volume levels anyway, uh, we hear very little bass and mids, but the treble is usually fine. That's because the speaker has a certain sensibility and construction sturdiness to resist at full power. To generate low frequencies, mm, the amp speaker needs energy because the cone has to move much more than for the high frequencies. And if there, if there is no juice uh, coming from the amp signal to the speaker, there won't be any low end. So we compensate for that uh, mm, with the EQ section of the amp. When the volume goes up, uh, all that bass and middle that we fine tune to, to our room it becomes excessive and while there's a lack in, in, the, in the treble range. This sudden uh, frequency image change at some point of loudness is not anymore inherent with the sound or the equipment itself, it, but it has to do with the way we hear. The human sense of hearing is very particular and uh, there is no way around it. Uh, we, we have to learn how to deal with it. There are two main things you should know. Our hearing is hugely affected by volume levels because of our eardrum. And our eardrum at different sound pressure level or SPL in the technical lingo convey different information to the brain. At low SPL, the ears are very sensitive to minute volume changes, while conversely, at high SPL, our hearing needs uh, mu much bigger steps in volume change to be able to perceive it. 
maybe you are guessing and you're guessing right that the reason why we all have logarithmic pots inside our guitars. That's because we hear in a logarithmic way. So to accommodate that we hear linear volume changes, okay, the pots have to be logarithmic. Uh, don't be fooled by those uh, linear pots marked with the letter B because they are not linear to our ears. This is very important. I know it may sound confusing, but this is the very basic psychoacoustic science. In most common passive wirings, we'll see only logarithmic pots uh, called also audio, and they are marked with, an, uh, with the letter A. If you have a Chinese made guitar or similar, uh, it, most probably you have linear pots inside uh, marked with the letter B. So for good measure, uh, you may want to, to check that and for an optimal response from your instrument, consider to replace them with those marked A250K for single coils and A500K for humbuckers. The other important element of the hearing sense behavior is that different frequencies or more simply different tone pitches stimulate differently our, let's say, CPU that's in charge to interpret them. In layman's terms, uh, that means that at same volume, we will hear some frequencies as louder and other as quieter, okay? So if you put your speakers at a fixed level, and if you sweep across the audible frequency range, which is in theory from 20 Hertz up to 20 kilohertz, you will hear a difference in, in volume between some of the frequencies. Keep in mind that the guitar frequency range in standard tuning is somewhere from 80 hertz up to 4.5 kilohertz, mostly due to, to, the, to the amps speaker uh, range. So in any case, we are able to hear above and below the spectrum of our instrument. To make it more fun, this psychoacoustic effect will change in relation to a different SPL at which our ears are exposed, producing um, different impressions of the frequency range. And that's happening accordingly to the fletcher manson curves. I'm leaving you below uh, a link uh, with a reference video to check out. So guess what? Let's watch a snippet from uh, Homeschooling Volume 19. So when you're when you're getting sounds like that in the studio, there's so much low end and stuff in there, and there's not a lot of mid range. So what I do is I like to dial in a lot of mid range. I'll take an EQ pedal and I'll boost the mid range a lot. Anytime I'm playing like low, clean sounds, I gas the mid range on uh, EQ pedal to get it to really speak in the mix. Because if you don't, it's too much of this EQ curve. It's like a high, lots of highs and lows with no mids, and it's like a smiley face Fletcher Munson curve. Look that up. Now let's see the Fletcher Munson diagram. On the horizontal axis, we have the frequency range. Remember, we hear from 20 hertz up to 20 kilohertz and you can see that the blue and and red curves start and finish accordingly these two colors are two different models of measuring developed during the years for our purposes we will refer to the red one which is the iso standard decibel wise consider that 60 db is the level of uh, conversational speech measured at uh, one meter distance and that uh, vacuum cleaner hits around 70 dB at the same distance. So we can consider this range in music as low volume. We can see that from 80 to 200 Hz, bass is still more prominent in comparison to the mids, uh, which go from 200 Hz up to 2 kHz. If you notice, there is not a huge visual difference 
between the curves at 60 and 80 dB, but some leveling between the lows and the mid start to occur, being more noticeable at higher SPL, and that's of utter importance. That's why Tom at low volume is boosting those mid to compensate that. In addition, the fundamental guitar frequencies are all low to mid range. If I remember correctly, when I was uh, learning and uh, reading a lot of books on mixing, uh, the biggest fight zone between the instruments uh, is around 350 hertz, and because there is a there is an area where many different instruments like to live. However, the sound we hear from each note we play also consists of harmonic frequencies in addition to the fundamental, also known as overtones, that ring out far above the fundamental. Therefore, any sacrifice in the midst will reflect throughout the entire frequency range. I had a really good rig on the Walsh tour. And the tone when you were standing on stage was just lovely. I had it dialed in like it was big, fat, warm, Gucci sound. And I remember thinking, man, this is, this is like tone heaven up here. And then I remember going over by his rig in the middle of the stage and it just like Joe's rig sounded like buzzing bees, man. It was just so bright, so troubling. Early in the day, I would go sit out in the crowd and I would watch our guitar techs, you know, test the rigs. And, and my rig sounded like this compared to Joe's. Joe's rig sounded amazing out front because all that treble. You can't have enough treble in an arena. There is no way you could put too much treble on a guitar in an arena. The shit that works in a studio or in your, in your basement doesn't really work in a 40,000 seat venue. Let's watch another tone guru, Matt Scofield, uh, and his tips on tone. First of all, on almost any amp, a bit more treble and a bit less bass is going to be a good starting point. Very rarely do you find an amp where you need the bass all the way up and the treble all the way up, unless it's like one of those weird 80s JCM 800s where you've got to turn the treble all the way up. But other than that, if it's a Fendery or a Marshall type amp, then you're going to want like a bit more treble than bass, generally. Okay, both Tom and Matt are talking about having abundant high frequencies. Uh, what's the importance of that? If we look at the graph again, we can see that from 2 kHz or the beginning of the high frequencies region up to 4 kHz, uh, there's a very pronounced dip regardless of the SPL. So for a balanced guitar sound, a uh, little less bass, enough mids and treble are the name of the game. Usually on a good instrument and on a good rig, the treble sounds rich and uh, complex, carrying a lot of harmonic information, uh, so very musical. And in addition to a good playing technique, uh, they should never sound harsh or ear piercing in a band context, unless uh, we really want to for some reason. The biggest issue inexperienced people encounter is an overpowered amp for the needs. If uh, a gig requires, let's say, 20, 30 watts amp and the amp is 100 watts, well, what will happen? A visual thinking guy that brings in the 100 watt beast uh, will need to turn it down quite a bit to a level where even a top-notch 100 watt amp sounds probably worse than, than a 15 watt Blues Junior. Those people should understand that a big amp is like a racing car and that's something also Matt says. Uh, it's made to go fast, the tubes, the speakers, the cabinet, every single component is thought, designed and built for a very specific use. So if it's used to go slightly faster than a pedestrian, everything that 
will come out will be flat and lifeless. The ultimate end of the chain mixer, which is the speaker, it may also be tuned for a completely different use, for a completely different EQ response. Just because the designer of the amp chooses a specific speaker and designs a box or a cabinet, and he takes in consideration those Fletcher Manson effect at a completely different uh, loudness level, or if you will, at completely different working range. So to make a big amp sound good at low volume, uh, a good power attenuator is critical, and that's a known thing. Let's hear what Matt Scofield says about that. Observations then. We're talking about bass and treble and the way you knock it down on the amp and you give it a bit more treble and you've got plenty of presence in there and there's that something I've always loved about your tone which I've noticed as the years have gone on is there is that I don't want to use the word fizzy because fizzy is a negative word but there is a presence in the high end by yeah, compression and bite yeah. yeah but I don't think that would work quietly no no it would sound horrible you, it has to be, or yeah. like even yeah. like doing this today. Yeah. There's no point in me bringing this in and then turning the master volume down. Yeah. Because all of this falls apart at that point. Yeah. You know, yeah, like yeah, every, yeah. it's like to me this is gain staging from the guitar volume yeah. and the pickup selection through each one of these. Everything is like part of a chain that eventually comes out of speakers. Then you change about, one oh, thing. We talk, talk about, about this all, all the time, time, and to hear someone who's. Does it? It's so it? important because that pedal doesn't sound like anything at all until you connect it to him, that guitar and that amp. And, yeah, right. yeah. and at that That's point, right. and then and then it also doesn't sound like anything with the with the volume turned down. No. So yeah, you, it's, it's all interconnected beyond yeah. any way of explaining. It's kind of depressing for for those of us who don't get to play really loud all the time because you know it's there. You know that's where the good stuff is, but. I could. I would say if, the, if if I wasn't able to use uh, an amp that powerful, and that's fifty, and I've got the new hundred as well, which doesn't really—it's not really loud. It's just even bigger. But um, you can get a similar effect off a smaller amp, but it's still not the same as moving the same that, mm. that air. Yeah, yeah. But you know, like even uh, yeah, if we had a deluxe, like a nice old deluxe or something, we could get close at less volume, and then the yeah. fuzz would work still. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the amp needs to be in its kind of happy place. Doesn't yeah. It? So I'd rather change amp sizes than adjust the not, Like yeah, those are not volume controls on amps to me. They are additional tone controls in a way. That's how I see them. So they get put where it sounds best, and then we have to deal with it one way or another. Whether it's a piece of so perspex so or you know angle it the other way or whatever. That you, that's the workaround. There's no such thing as a master volume. Right? When a tone is generated, it's made, as we said, from the dominant, which is the most prominent audible frequency, and in its information there are also contained overtones, the harmonics of the dominant. Those are less audible, kind of buried in the overall mix of the band. So we can try to improve, or let's say, expand the range of the guitar by compressing with something like an RC booster, drive pedal or a drive channel of the amp in order to, to add some harmonic distortion which produces overtones and a fuller, warmer sound. For even more flexibility, it may be a good idea to use an eye compressor pedal itself, because by compressing, uh, we are not broadening that much the sound in horizontal, in a way that the guitar occupy um, more of the frequencies. As much as we are beefing up uh, those frequencies uh, already present in the sound. Even people like Matt, uh, uh, or guys like Josh Smith and others uh, say clearly that they want the minimal possible amount of compression in their signal chain, uh, but that's not always the case. They are not wrong, but they play pretty loud for 
nowadays standards. So at that level, they have plenty of dynamic range to work with. And it's obvious they, they don't want their sound squashed in any way. Of course, they have also the greatest ability to controlling those dynamic possibilities. At low volume level, or even at medium volume, the situation is different. Between the audience and the background ambient noise and the maximum volume ceiling imposed by the venue, uh, there is such little dynamic range at our disposal. So you will say that compressing then is completely wrong. But uh, to sound any good, we have to put some information into the speaker to make it move, to make it work. And at low volume, there's no signal juice, or if you will, fuel for the speaker to work properly. But the amp tubes also are not working at optimal level. So we have a different feeling on the instrument in relation to the uh, we receive from the amp feedback. The notes usually tend to kind of die on us and because there's very little sustain. To me, this, let's call it input-output information lag is maybe the first step to take care before the sound quality itself. And that's because even if we are able to squeeze some decent sounds from our rig, which will probably do, by not having the right feeling on the instrument, it's very probable that we will struggle uh, all the way along during all the gig. For that reason, in my book, uh, compressing gently with the intelligence, with taste and uh, clear gold in our minds, it's actually a good idea for this particular purpose. Since for what I see, there are very few EQ pedals on the boards are there and some kind of compression may be the valid alternative. So you may want also try both at the same time, but that requires some diligence because it's possible to compress first and EQ after and vice versa. In short, the first method is more intuitive and produces uh, less hum, which is of paramount importance if you are playing uh, some kind of single coil guitar. The second method requires uh, a more analytic approach, hence uh, more knowledge and sensibility to achieve the best result. This last method is likely to produce more hum in the hands of an inexperienced user. And the Boss GE7, the pedal that Matt uses, is known for that. And Tom says it clearly that it has to be modded. <laughs> so then, and then my favorite pedal of all these pedals is the old Boss EQ. Man, I got that pedal and it's really noisy. Well, you gotta get them modded. What's the mod? Well, they just quiet them down. They can, you can go in and get all the hiss out of them. So before you buy it, add this mod to, to your budget. Regardless of what I said here, I'm sure that everyone will find what works best for them. In the next video, I'll show you how I use my Origin Effect Slide Rig Compressor. Make sure you don't miss it by subscribing to this channel. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, take care.